<laughs> My dear chap. Oh. <laughs> it's wonderful. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Excellent. Being so close to Worcester today, I hoped I'd see some nice Worcester porcelain, but you've brought along a really very special piece, and uh, you know, the likes of which I've never seen before. Oh, tell me about it. Well, it's, it's made by uh, the Grangers in George Granger's time, and mm -hmm. it's come down through the family. Uh, in fact, uh, I've just established that George Granger was my great-great-grandfather. Grangers were one of the great porcelain makers yes. In, yes. in Worcester. Yes. In, here's the name on the back, G. Granger & Co. Worcester. And they were the, the other Worcester factory, the smaller factory, the other side of the city. And Paul Granger is generally thought of as being not, not nothing on the same league as the great Royal Worcester factory. But here is a piece that shows just how good Granger could be. We, we think it was made about uh, 1840 and it's been handed down generation and, and loved. And um, the story that my mother told me was that um, it's an extra from a, a set that was made for Queen Victoria to give the Tsar. But we haven't been able to corroborate this. Uh, in fact, we approached the um, Worcester Museum who had mm. no record of it. Yes. And the Hermitage in, in Russia. Oh, yeah. right, so you've been searching yes. all around. and the Royal Collection. And the Royal yes, Collection right. also yeah. had no mm. record. Looking at the piece, it has, of course, proud mm. in the middle. Mm. Um, there are the arms of Queen Victoria. And in the panels around the border, you've got the different royal palaces. What, you've got Windsor Castle there. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's the Buckingham Palace. And I think so. And here were the little figures, charming figures in the foreground yes. there. And... There we've got the pavilion at Brighton. Yes. Are they mm. hand painted? Um, beautifully hand painted. We've looked at it through magnifying glass, and it's amazing. The gilding there, uh, this amazing rays and barbs, I mean, it's just unlike any other English royal services. Um, all the factories made pieces for Queen Victoria and for William the Fourth beforehand, but this is so much more splendid, more eccentric than that. Mm. Um, we know that um, there were pieces made for the Queen Victoria and services which went back and forward between um, England and Russia, but this never went, this stayed in the family, so is this some sort of sample? I mean, with this quality, why didn't they get the order, I wonder? But what I've never seen before on Grange or any other factories is these model flowers stuck on the plates in addition, the little roses, are each made by hand and stuck on. Yes, you couldn't eat off of it, could you? Uh, not, not very easy. <laughs> really. Can you imagine, imagine even in a royal palace trying to carve your feet off there? Maybe it was just a, a bit too silly. They've gone, yes. gone over the top mm. and the order wasn't placed. How do you value a royal plate in a family like that? Have you thought yeah. about it? No. Well, we thought, but uh, I not, don't know. It's not even insured. I mean, maybe £4,000. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Excellent. I can tell from the quality of the binding that they are something special. Uh, that is a wonderful quality green Morocco binding. We've probably got a binder's name in it somewhere. Yes, there's, there's, that's the binder's name. Oh, fascinating. R. Ingleton Drake binder. Now, more than that, we've got a Victoria signature here, haven't we? Yes, we have, yes. And, and this one as well? That one as well, yes. Right. They were two books given to... Uh, my children's great great grandfather. I see. Uh, on her visit in 1889 to North Wales, and she stayed at Palais Hall, which was the family home then. That all makes sense. They are, in fact, the famous leaves from the Journal of Our Life in the Highlands, written by Queen Victoria, and this is more leaves from the journal. So, a, a sequel, as it were. A sequel. Now, what we've got there is a facsimile autograph, yes. and what we have over here is the real autograph. Yes. Now, that, that's a very fine inscription. It looks to me as if it's all been done by Queen Victoria. Now, that in itself is uncommon. More, more often than not, the, the, the inscription would have been done by a secretary, and then it would simply been signed by the Queen. But the, 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 the slope of the hand, the colour of the ink, all tells me that she's done that all herself, which is most uncommon. So uh, she, she, she obviously uh, valued Mr Robertson, uh, and, and was very pleased to have visited him. I love this as well. That was the house, uh -huh. um, the Palais, where she stayed, and it was built in, I think, the 1870s by this Henry Barr Robertson's father. And he sadly died just before her visit. Um, so he was the host to her. 
Um, and that was dinner, which looks rather good. It does look rather good. <laughs> Her okay. Majesty's Dinner, August the 24th, 1889. Uh, all in French, but I, if, if I'm correct, she ended up with uh, creme brulee. <laughs> very delicious, That's very nice. That's very nice indeed. Well, these are, uh, these are unique. Mm. Uh, they are in remarkably good condition. What value can I put on them indeed? We've got all the right points. We've got a quality binding. We've got both volumes. We've got the complete set, as it were. Uh, we've got them both autographed, which is absolutely splendid. On the open market, five, six, perhaps 700 pounds. That sort of level on the open market. Well, they were given to my great-grandfather, who was chef to Edward VII and to Queen Victoria at the end of her reign, um, by the crowned heads of Europe. And some of these are the Russian pieces. Amazing. Now, do you think that they were they were, they were objects given um, almost as a sort of thank you to to this? That's right. Yes. And is this all the things that you have? Are there any more? No, I have some other pieces which come from um, Manuel of Portugal, um, Kaiser Bill. All the visitors to Sandringham, all the visitors to Buckingham Palace, all the cousins of the British royal family mm. that descended from Queen Victoria. That's right. In yes. a sense, she's a fountainhead of, of this sort of yes, society, European royal society. Right. Let's, let's have a look at those. These, these mm. are, are Russian ones and uh, a pair of gold cufflinks set mm. with um, rubies and diamonds, alternating rubies and diamonds, in mm. uh, a sort of nugget effect. Nugget, you... that's, that's what I've always been told, yes, gold nuggets. And there's a most marvellous word in Russia used to describe this, which is called samorodok, which means a nugget. Oh, and, uh, uh, and, and it's a very, very Russian technique, uh, much favoured by Fabergé. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, these are not by Fabergé, and the lid satin rather conveniently tells us that they're yes. made by, by uh, somebody called Ivanov, mm -hmm. um, working in St. Petersburg. And it's certain that they are a gift from the member of the imperial family because the imperial family's yes. cipher appears cipher. above. Yes. And uh, do you know exactly who gave those? I think it was our Nicholas. He certainly came to London and he certainly went to Sandringham mm -hmm. and uh, there were many opportunities in which he could have offered those. Tell me about the, what you know about him as a chef. Why was he so favoured, do you think? Well, he was a Frenchman to start with and I understand he had been chef to people like the Rothschilds and had been to Saltram in Devon. And um, Edward VII heard of him and wanted him to be his chef and I think he may have poached him. What did from, he look like? Do we know what he looked like? Yes, I have a picture here. Oh, isn't it marvellous? And with his of family. Of his family, with, um, with mother, with his wife, and the two daughters, my grandmother and my aunt. Oh, that's very touching, isn't mm. it? My goodness. Yes, he looks quite sort picture. of... Uh, uh, a Well, it doesn't he? He's a brilliant <laughs> chap, I must say. Yes. And so these were his things. Well, let's just mm. run through them a little bit further. Have you thought about these ones here? Well, I, w I have been told that they were cufflinks, but they have little rings on, as you can see just there. And... Um, I really don't know. I imagine because they were given to my great-grandfather, they must have been cufflinks, I feel, and because he only had daughters, um, possibly the daughters had them um, made into brooches or pendants. I think what has happened, and rather sadly, is that when these adaptations have been made to turn them into brooches, that yeah. the marks had been lost, but these are yes. very characteristic of Fabergé's work. Okay. We call this guilloché enamel, and it's uh, an engine-turned gold mount that's flooded with translucent pink enamel, mm -hmm. and then the, the imperial eagle is applied as a, a gold cipher over and above that. In every way, they're positively reek of Fabergé. Mm -hmm. But in stamp but collecting terms, I can't be absolutely can't certain. Be certain. But mm. I can be certain about this one. And yes. uh, does the family history say that that was an imperial that, gift? They do. They do say. The family told me that that was definitely given by Tsar Nicholas. Well, as I don't think there's any any doubt about that at all. And there's absolutely no doubt at all that this is a, a, a full-blown Fabergé brooch. Is it? it is. Oh, wonderful. It's a, it's signed. Because I um, wondered, and I you know I sort of half hoped it would be, and um, that's marvellous. Yeah, well, it's, it's a most distinguished thing. Again, the use of the guilloché enamel, yes. uh, yellow enamel in this case, yes. and two colours of gold, yes. little laurel wreaths, and um, tied with a diamond bow, mm. for, um, emblematic of peace, and and the Romanov crown set with diamonds and circled yeah. with pearls. And we know it's Fabergé because on the back here, there's mm -hmm. the workmaster's initials um, for August Holming, who was um, uh, not necessarily a specialist jeweller, but, uh, but a worker in all, all, all manner of enamel work. So goodness me, and there's more at home. There's yes, more, more there's souvenirs. More, yes, well, it's... a few more, yes, a few more. <laughs> now, as for value, um, the cufflinks are, are impressive. They're very Russian, very Russian technique, mm -hmm. in the manner of Fabergé, but a rose by any other name smells as sweet, but it certainly isn't as valuable. No, um, no. And I think, with an imperial provenance, nonetheless, they are, they are very desirable, very wearable. Mm -hmm. um, 
and a very precise provenance, so I suppose something like seven or eight thousand pounds for the cufflings. Really? <laughs> My goodness gracious me. <laughs> <laughs> nothing to do with intrinsic value, nothing yeah. at all. These, yeah. um, I believe them to be Fabergé from a technical basis, really, and uh, as souvenirs yeah. of Nicholas II, which is absolutely certain, mm -hmm. um, I think we can go a bit mad again. Eight to ten thousand pounds for those. <laughs> <laughs> You're feeling calm? <laughs> it's very, very good, isn't it? Making me nervous. I don't really want to sell, you see, no. do I want to keep? And they're, no. Yes, because they're family pieces. Well, I think in a way but they should be kept together as a collection. Should they? That's because what that I want to ask Context is everything mm. here and provenance, actually. Yes. And what about this one? Any ideas for that one? Well, if these are that price, that must be £10,000. Well, it is £10,000, yeah. and oh, it's gosh. more than £10,000. Is it? Yep. It's £15,000. My dear chap. God. <laughs> Gosh. It's wonderful. That's amazing. I never realised it would be as much as that, I must confess. No. Now, what's special about this? Well, the history to it. And um, tell me what the history is. Well, it's supposed to have belonged to Lady Jane Grey. Mm -hmm. Well, I think what's fascinating about this piece of jewellery is that it's mounted in, 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 in silver in a most particular way. Um, in the 17th century, and in the 16th century too, they'd find these little pieces of natural history, shells and horns and, and uh, hooves of antelopes and beetles and this sort of thing, and mount them up and turn them into what are called magical jewels. These are talismanic jewels and they're worn to ward off the evil eye. Now this is all, it is a broken one, but I can see that it's a cowrie shell. Yeah. And it, it, the, the magical significance of the cowrie shell is that it's um, a fertility symbol, a female fertility symbol, yeah. which brings with it good luck. And um, we turn it over and it says, rather disarmingly, Jane Grey died 1554. Why on earth um, one should suppose that such a tiny, tiny little jewel should have anything to do with a, a queen of England, albeit a queen who only reigned for nine days, is really stretching credibility to the limits, isn't yeah. it? Well, it is, yeah. So I think what we, what we can be faced with here is that we've got um, a late 16th, early 17th century magical jewel mounted in silver with an added punch referring to a queen who died after reigning only nine days. Yeah. She died a violent death in the Tower of London with the axe. And this, I know, and this is a reference to her. Yeah. She's a, a Protestant heroine, and, and that, I think, is why it's engraved on the back. And this is no way meant to deceive. It also no way is it meant for us to believe that this is a, a jewel directly from her. Yeah. It's just a, 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 a reference to a, an English martyr. Yeah. Marvellous, marvellous thing. Can you imagine how we're going to value this? Not really, because I can't see that it has a lot of value. No, and I think you're absolutely right. I'd say its value is absolutely next to nothing, which is absolutely unimportant to me, because I think it's loaded with interest. And let's hope it brings some good luck to both of us. That'd be nice, wouldn't well, it? Well, it would. I don't know how many pieces of commemorative wear I've seen today here in Chichester, but 10, 20. Mm -hmm. Some of them go back to Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee in 1887. And what are they worth? 20 to 30 pounds. Mm -hmm. So for the person who bought them for, I don't know, two shillings in 1887, no way have they proved a good investment. Correct. <laughs> now, and I don't believe that any of these will. I mean, a lady came in earlier with a plate uh, for the Golden Jubilee. She just bought it. I don't know if she bought it this morning, but she just bought it. And she said, should I keep this as an investment? And I said, don't think of it on those terms. That is not the point. The point is, do you like it? Oh, yes, I like it. Well, that's that's what it's all about. You've have had obviously pleasure putting together these commemorative pieces, which range from the jubilee pieces through uh, the coronation of uh, George V. You've got Edward the Seventh. Edward the Seventh. Then we got three of Edward the Eighth. Why three? They just happened to come along uh, at the time. I mean, my son was just getting interested in this sort of thing and uh, asked me if he was interested. He says, oh, yes, I'd like to buy those. 
Right. Well, this is, I think, the, n the nicest one, really. Yes. yes. Beautifully Beautiful. transfer printed with a bit of hand mm -hmm. colour on. Um, it goes all the way round. The date, May the 12th, 1937. And on the bottom, in gold, um, a perpetual souvenir. Well, it would only be perpetual if you didn't drop it um, <laughs> in Paragon, China. Paragon was a good factory, in fact. <laughs> Uh, crowned Westminster Abbey, May the 12th, 1937. Well, of course... It didn't happen. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. No. <laughs> it didn't happen. He abdicated. Um, and people imagine that because he abdicated, um, these pieces are worth a lot of money. But he was a hugely popular um, Prince of Wales, and enormous numbers were made for the coronation in advance. Um, and uh, that was that. George the Sixth came along. Correct, yes. The bulk of what's here is five pounds to thirty pounds. Yes. Mm -hmm. But this one is going to be worth two hundred to three hundred pounds. So I thought it they was were a good pretty. And we just like them. They're good quality. That's what sets these aside from those. Yes. And if one is buying commemoratives always go for the best quality Absolutely. that you can find. One story we haven't heard is the, is the one about Harrogate and the Russian royal family jewels. Princess Alex of Hesse, when she was engaged to the, the Tsarevich of Russia, came to Harrogate for treatment for sciatica. And while she was here staying in a boarding house, the landlady gave birth to twins. The Tsarina, the future Tsarina, took this as a good luck omen and insisted that she be godmother to those twins. And she gave a number of gifts at the christening, the cufflinks and the nappy pin that she bought here in Harrogate. And then when she returned to Russia, she sent gifts to the family subsequently, up until the 21st birthday in 1915, when she sent this beautiful gold cross to the male twin. Shortly after that, of course, the, the gifts stopped. Sadly, yes, the uh, Russian family came to a very unpleasant end, and that was the end of that story. But the beginning of our story, because the son of the male twin came to Harrogate in 1993. He had no family, and he wanted these items to be where they would be appreciated and where they had meaning. And of course, here in the Royal Pump Room Museum in Harrogate, they have tremendous meaning. So they've really come home. Yes, they have. They've come home and they tell a very Harrogate story. A plumber's son being christened, butcher's son being his godfather, and the future Tsarina of Russia standing as godmother. Sums up the essence of Harrogate in its spa heyday. This room is full of wonderful things, from these less well-known paintings to perhaps the jewel in the crown of the Woburn Abbey collection. It's the Armada portrait. It's by Gower. It's of Queen Elizabeth I of England, and here she is in all her splendour. Why is this picture an icon? An icon's a good word, I think, because this is an object of worship. I think it's, you start with its sheer size. I mean, it's unusually large for an Elizabethan portrait. She's life-size, pretty much. And that's going to impress in itself. And then again, the Elizabethan viewer of this picture would have been in absolutely no doubt as to its message. I mean, just look at that dress. Look at those jewels. And look at the sheer quantity, let alone the quality, of all those pearls. It's astonishing. The only thing that's actually human in this portrait are our hands and face, and even they tell you something. The hand, for example, resting on the globe. It's a map of Europe, that, and her fingers are, you know, uncomfortably close to the country of Spain, I'd say. And then we can start to unravel the picture and see where the message is. It's pretty clear, I think, and would have been to anyone looking at it in Elizabethan times. You have the mermaid here, symbolising Britain's power at sea. And as if to drive the point home, you've got the British fleet up here, driving fire ships into the Spanish Armada. And as every schoolboy knows, that breaks up this terrible threat to the security of Britain. And it's blown then by bad weather around the northeastern coast of Britain, and it's wrecked and it's foundered. And at last, Britain is safe from this terrible threat. What this picture is saying, therefore, is look out, King Philip of Spain. Look out, anyone in Europe. And don't you touch us. We're at the top of our power, and we'll do to you what we did to the Armada. The, the message is completely unequivocal. It's a Mrs Thatcher's handbag of a painting. <laughs> so it's more propaganda than portrait? Well, yes, you'd have to say so. She's only got 15 years left to live in this picture, and of course, 
uh, she'd have been surrounded in her gorgeous court by women who are younger and prettier than her. And in fact, um, there's a portrait of an absolute cracker over here. I thought we'd have a look. Ah, who is she? Well, she's Frances Howard, and she was lovely. If this portrait over here was intended to say, stay away, look out, then this portrait was designed to say, look at me, come and get me. It was painted some 50 years later than the Armada portrait. And what we're seeing is, is a much more human approach. This is a girl who you could talk to. I mean, she is absolutely gorgeous, I think. It's an advertisement for her beauty. Certainly the, the clothes she's wearing show her station in life. She's obviously very rich. To have this kind of embroidery, it must have cost an absolute fortune. But her eyes, I think, are absolutely lovely, don't you? There's this lovely black, deep colour. You could lose yourself in those eyes. And her lips, the colours are, are just very, very warm and inviting. And I've, I've never seen a girl wear a ruff so sexily. I must say, I like to pick a girl out in a crowd. And of all the pictures at Woburn, I think she's my favourite. Can you tell me anything about its history? Well, it came to me from my great-grandfather, who was General the Honourable Sir Percy Fielding, and it was given to his brother, his elder brother, who was later the 8th Earl, by Queen Adelaide. I presume as a, probably a 21st present or perhaps as a yeah. souvenir of, of services in equity. Do you know whether it's actually ever been used at all? Because I notice it's a bit bashed and bruised <laughs> around. I'm rather ashamed of the state of it. I think it did, yes, because yeah. my great-grandfather fought throughout the Crimean War. Ah, and well, was that's, wounded at that's quite possibly a very good clue to why it's in its present rather yeah. bruised state, because this donut looking thing actually should screw together mm. but for some reason or other the screw which is meant to come through into the mm. middle doesn't reach no. but if we take it apart it is actually as you I'm sure you know a traveling chamber stick now these are quite rare things but the, the nice thing about this is that nearly all of them are 19th century this one is 18th century and if we turn it over we've got some very worn hallmarks just here and I just ah we've got a date letter Q here and that means they were actually made in 1771 now they should have other marks on the ah that's the only mark surviving that can tell you who the maker is. And the maker's mark is EC for Ebenezer Coca. Coca was a well-known candlestick maker um, from the 1760s and early 1770s. And these were absolutely typical of the sort of item that was taken around Europe on the grand tour. Now, I notice also, judging by what you were saying, um, it says here, given to the Honourable William Fielding by Queen Adelaide, Christmas 1846. And with that royal in inscription, that sets them up on, on a slightly uh, More different, different level. Yeah. Have you ever had a, a figure put on them by any professional? No, no, never, never. I've just regarded them as curiosities, really, certainly not as anything of moment. Well, I, I think your insurers uh, ought to know about them because uh, I would put a figure of £5,000 on no, these alone. Yeah. But this is quite a find. Now, what, what we have here is a, is a waist belt clasp. Now, on the back is stamped Earl's Court Exhibition, mm -hmm. right? On the front, we have uh, 1887 Jubilee. Now, that's Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee. Mm -hmm. And this was the very first time that Buffalo Bill came to England with his Wild West show. Mm -hmm. And he brought Annie Oakley with him. And there's Annie Oakley firing away, laying back on a horse. And she was introduced to Queen Victoria. And Queen Victoria said to her, you're a clever little lady. And where did you get it? A car boot. Car boot. How much do you pay for it? 30. I think you can put certainly put one naught on the end of that. That's lovely. And I would think possibly three to four hundred pounds. Really? Oh, yes. So Annie Oakley is, is really oh, collectible. Brilliant. Thank you. This derives from a design conceived by Prince Albert. He asked for 12 bridesmaids' brooches to be made 
out of these materials for the Queen to hand out immediately after the wedding ceremony. And it's absolutely loaded with um, amatory significance. This is a hand on which a lovebird has alighted. It's a lovebird made of turquoise. And in the language of the lapidary, the turquoise stands for true love. It's an echo of the colour of the forget-me-not flower, and it means forget-me-not too. But also you can see lurking here is a tiny little ruby eye for the, for the lovebird. Mm -hmm. And in the, again, in the language of the lapidary, this stands for passion. So we've got passionate true love. And also we want that forever, dream on, as they say. <laughs> but it's true um, in that the fingernails of the hand are actually diamonds, and diamonds are forever. So this is forever passionate true love in a tiny jewel like this. What does it mean to you? Well, I just love it. Mm. Um, you uh, wear it? And I do wear it, yes. Had you got a clue about its, its meaning, its hidden meaning? Uh, well, I, I, no, I hadn't really. No. No. no, no. Well, in a way, that's good fun because I think the point about jewellery is that it does act on us kind of subliminally. There's something very deep-seated in us, this understanding, and we don't have to think about it very carefully and hard. But I must say, it's hugely animated. I mean, it really is very sculptural, and that's quite rare in jewellery. Um, usually, it's very sort of two-dimensional, and um, and it is the liveliest composition I've I've seen of this type of jewellery. Intrinsic value is nothing, really, absolutely nothing. I mean, r really no more than sort of 80 to 100 pounds in the value of the stones, but in the value of the composition, 800 pounds. Goodness, I'll still wear it. Good, that's what it's for. Thank you very much. Thank you. We seem to have a, almost a full house here of all the royal residences. Curiously, locally, we don't have Sandringham, but uh, how did you come by this collection? Um, it was handed down to my uh, step-grandfather mm -hmm. by uh, the chief librarian of Windsor Castle. And was, was he Mr Woodward? That, yeah, that's correct. Mr. Right. Mr Woodward uh, was appointed there in 1860, and uh, the scrapbook and the invitations were handed down by him, a, m a member of his family, through down to my family. Right. He seems to have been invited to all the great events too, so he obviously had a, a nice, quite a nice life. It's a wonderful picture of, uh, of life in Victorian England, isn't it, with these wonderfully grand invitations. But uh, although those are very interesting, really the, the main thing is this fantastic album here. And perhaps it's worth starting right almost right at the beginning. This is full of absolutely riveting things, isn't it? It is. And while he was at Windsor Castle, he obviously was in the habit of receiving letters and writing letters on behalf of the Queen and the other members of the royal family. And rather than chucking them away like we do today, he obviously kept them, and he kept them nicely mounted in this album. Um, and I think one of the nicest things right at the beginning is uh, are these two scribbled little notes from Queen Victoria to him in pencil, just asking him to make sure that he could, um, it says, Dear Mr. Woodward, send over those drawings, and then it's rather difficult to read which drawings, which is rather maddening, isn't it? But you can imagine her rather imperiously saying, send over those drawings, Woodward. And, uh, and here it is, November the 17th, 1864. On this occasion, she's asking for a volume of somebody's English history. You know, it conjures up a wonderful picture of Queen Victoria sitting in her ivory tower, <laughs> sending for Woodward and, his, uh, and, and all his books. He was obviously clearly a, a, fr a friend of the royal family, because here you've got this absolutely delightful sketch where it says here, Princess Louise and Miss Bower. In the distance, B.B. Woodward and Mr. Roland Ruland. So this is actually Woodward in one of the drawings. Yes, it is. Their album is just full of the most extraordinary things, and you know, it would take weeks to go through it all. You've got here a check signed by the Duke of Wellington, um, here you've got a letter from John Ruskin, you know, the great man of letters and uh, the arbiter of taste in Victorian times about art. Sadly, the content of the letters isn't wildly exciting. It would be nice if he was making groundbreaking comments, but nevertheless, it's still very interesting. There's a limit to what you can say to a librarian, though, isn't there? Well, I suspect that's right, and I think it's, it's a very good comment. I think you know, that the relationship with these people was a professional relationship rather than a, an intimate relationship. In other words, he wasn't writing as a friend to dear Woodward. You know, he was writing, you're quite right, probably more instructive or, or demanding, rather, like Queen Victoria's. Yes. Yeah. And this, of course, is extremely rare, uh, Florence Nightingale. 
um, you know, you just don't get Nightingale autographs like this. And so it goes on. I mean, the whole thing is absolutely wonderful. And once again, there's another of the great Victorian figures, uh, Darwin. Fantastic. And you know, as I say, it would take weeks to go through them all, but it's a, a real treat to see them. It's very difficult until one has a chance to go right through the whole lot to, to put a value on it. And at the end of the day, I suspect, you know, because they're clipped out and pasted in, you know, the value of some of the letters has diminished a bit. But I can imagine with a bit of research, it would be worth somewhere between five and ten thousand pounds for the uh, for the collection. Uh, the drawing alone is worth probably seven or eight hundred. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, jolly nice thing to have. I can't believe how bright and colourful a funeral procession is. Here is the carriage of Her Majesty the Queen and two of Her Majesty's suite. And we go on, this is so colourful. The British Army, the Highlanders, looking as bright as they possibly could. You must have kept this extremely well out of the way. And look at all this colour, it's just absolutely magnificent for a funeral service. And here, chief mourner, the Duke of Wellington. Well, this, of course, is the Duke of Wellington's funeral. And here is the man himself. And look at that for colour. That is the most incredible plate, isn't it? It's fun. You know all this is um, cast iron. This is, oh, no, this, is this, really? this is all cast iron. When I was a boy, you could actually go and see this in uh, St Paul's Cathedral, where he was buried. And uh, so the legend goes that this was all so heavy that they couldn't get it up Ludgate Hill. He was two hours late for his own funeral, which I think is a, <laughs> a, a wonderful, wonderful um, thing to be. Why not? <laughs> and so it goes on. It really is absolutely magnificent. So tell me about it. Well, my... No, I must get the right number of greats. I think it's two <laughs> greats. Great-great-grandfather, um, through a friend, had a ticket somewhere on Ludgate Hill in order to uh, see this procession. And I think I'm right in saying this was only produced about a year afterwards. It probably took quite a long time to produce it. Absolutely. And he bought yes. it afterwards. I think the receipt is well, actually you see, in the front. The, you're absolutely right. I find this absolutely fascinating because I've never seen uh, a receipt from Ackermans before. One panorama, Duke's funeral, not Duke's of Wellington's funeral, 31 and 6. Expensive. I mean, that's, that's incredible. And this note here, uh, my father, James Passmore, saw this possession from a window in Ludgate Hill and paid 20 guineas for their seats. That must have been a lot of money in 1852. But I mean, surely you couldn't, you couldn't buy a house in 1852 for, 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 that, for that sort of money. I just think it's quite incredible. It does need some repair. Um, inevitably, as time has gone on, it has fallen uh, apart in a few of the folds. But it is an absolutely wonderful thing. And of course, stretching out to 10 whole feet. Well, I suspect that even in the condition it's in now, it's probably about 1,500 to 2,000 pounds. But it is magnificent. Thank, Thank you, you much. so much. Thank you. Well, this is a, a piece of silver from the officer's mess of the King's Royal Azars. And uh, it was presented to the 10th Azars, Prince of Wales' own, uh, by King George IV on his accession to the throne to commemorate his time in command of the 10th Azars. Do you know what most people don't realise about these great centrepieces? is what, what extraordinary construction kits they are. And if you don't get these in the right place, they don't necessarily fit properly. So do, do you know who made it? We believe it was made by a silversmith called Paul Storr. We've actually got a maker's mark appearing here. And the, the maker's mark there is PR. Now, that is not Paul Storr's mark. Um, the, in fact, the, the clue to the whole thing is... Let's just... Where are we? Here we are. The inscription that runs around here, Rundle Bridge et Rundle Orifice Regis. Rundle Bridge and Rundle, the Royal Goldsmiths. The maker's mark there is that of... Philip Rundell. I would suggest the greatest firm that there has ever been in the history of silver. But what Rundell did was to develop this firm uh, in Ludgate Hill so that you had the top goldsmiths of the day. He wanted all the top men. So Digby Scott, Benjamin Smith, James Smith, and Paul Storr. I mean, it, it's like a who's who um, of the Regency period. 
it is, of course, silver gilt, not gold, which I'm sure is, is, is what you yes. uh, realise. It would be pretty well impossible to pick up. H had you considered value? Uh, well, it's obviously insured amongst the regimental property in silver, uh, right. and its last valuation, uh, we believe, about 10 years ago, uh, had it in the area of £750,000. Right, 750000 I th I would go along with that. It is, after all, a unique piece. Commissioned by the King for presentation to one of the great, greatest of all the regiments. I mean, what a piece to have.